What if science and religion were mine to wield as I choose? What if I'm God? What if I'm God? Strangely, that community bit is one of the best ways to describe the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. For those not familiar with it, it's a slice of life series about a high school club. Except one of the characters is a reality warping god, and most of their adventures involve time travel, aliens, and shady government agencies, among other wacky things. It's one of the most popular light novel series of all time, not to mention an incredibly popular and revered anime series. Now, I've always been fairly neutral about the series. By the time I watched it, it was already considered old, and even then, I never understood the hype for it, at first. And while my thoughts on a lot of things have changed over time, this isn't one of them. And while many of its flaws are really obvious, Do something, Mikudo. the other stuff really adds up. But that doesn't mean it's all bad, not by a long shot. There's a lot of really cool, really interesting stuff we're talking about. That's why this video is here in the first place. And before moving on, this is your spoiler warning. I'll be going over both the anime series and the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya. For the most part, the light novels and the spin-offs aren't that relevant here. We good? Cool. Let's check out the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, starting with the series itself. Right off the bat, the series premise is one of its strongest qualities. It starts out as your basic, run-of-the-mill slice-of-life series, complete with an average, ordinary main character, Kyon. But this lasts about half an episode. Not even that, if you're watching the original broadcast order. The first episode opens with a bold proclamation from one of Kion's classmates, the titular character herself, Haruhi Suzumiya. People, but if any of you are aliens, time travelers, or espers, please come see me. That is all. At first, the rest of the characters fall into generic anime tropes. We have the shy upperclassman, the quiet bookworm, and the punchable transfer student. But soon enough, they reveal themselves to be the very things Haruhi wished for. Mikuru Asahina is a time traveler from the not-too-distant future. Yuki Nagato is a robot built by aliens. And Itsuki Koizumi possesses psychic abilities. In the midst of all this is Haruhi, who possesses the godlike ability to alter reality itself. The universe, quite literally, revolves around Haruhi Suzumiya. And the other wrinkle is that Haruhi can't know any of this. It's implied that she's the reason that time travelers, aliens, and espers exist, but nobody knows what will happen if she finds out. On one hand, nothing will happen, and business will go about as usual. But since the worst case scenario is universal destruction, it's better to keep her in the dark for now. So after the first few episodes, the real premise of the series becomes clear. The characters have to deal with all manner of mysterious phenomena, whether they come from Haruhi herself or outside forces and they have to entertain a stubborn, volatile god to make sure she doesn't cause too much chaos. The supernatural sci-fi adventures speak for itself. It's a good way to shake up any normal setting, but the second point is where it gets really interesting. The idea of keeping a reality warping god in check is something straight out of a Lovecraft story. It sounds weird to say about a high school anime series, but it's true. There's an uncanny similarity between Haruhi and Azathoth, a sleeping god that threatens to destroy all reality if it wakes up. The premise is what got me into the series in the first place, and considering how popular the series is, I'm sure I'm not the only one. And while the premise is solid, the other standout quality is our main character, Kion. He's the only normal human in the group, and serves as both the narrator and the straight man to the group's antics. On paper, he sounds pretty boring. The guy even looks kinda generic. But what saves this character is his inner monologue. Okay, asking somebody how long they believed in Santa Claus is so stupid you can't even consider it a topic suitable for idle conversation. From the first minute of the show, it's apparent that Kion is the kind of person with a lot to say, but never feels like outright saying it. Check out his dialogue from the first episode. I picked a number out of a cookie tin that gave me the seat next to the window, second from the back. Farewell, Haruhi. Forever. And this continues throughout the series. He's witty and sarcastic, and has an opinion on just about everything. We're privy to his thoughts at all times, 
adding insight and characterization to a character who, as he himself describes, is very boring and ordinary. As the narrator, his narration is dripping with his dry, cynical personality. And it's usually really funny. He complains about many of the same things we would if we were in his place. There's no need to worry. I've yet to find an occasion when you told us not to worry and we really didn't have to worry. And his inner monologue plays a key role throughout the series. We're always aware of what Kion's thinking, but as we see, his actions don't always line up with his thoughts. Kion's honestly the best character in the show. He's so good, he brings out the best in almost every other character. Almost every other character. He's a great example of a main character, narrator, and audience surrogate done well. And it's not like it's some radical form of storytelling. It's as simple as giving a character a personality and giving them a way to show that personality to the audience. I know that's like a really simple thing to praise, but many, many characters can't even accomplish that. And don't forget, the novels came out in 2003. There's no excuses for garbage character writing like this. I'm the protagonist of this operation. So, amazing premise and main character aside, the actual main series can be split into different arcs as follows. And for the sake of organization, this will be in the chronological order. The melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, which is the introduction to this world and the characters. Remote Island Syndrome, which is a murder mystery on a remote island. Endless Eight, an animated masterpiece the likes of which we've never seen before. And the sigh of Haruhi Suzumiya, Haruhi's attempt to break into the film industry. Everything else in between are one-off, more standalone episodes. Of the episode arcs, the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya is the one I'd consider the strongest. It begins innocently enough with Haruhi recruiting, well, more like conscripting, members for her new club. But the layers are peeled back very quickly, with each episode revealing a new character, revelation, or plot thread. I don't feel so good. It's a solid introduction to the series, and it's here where it balances the weirdness, slice of life, and character writing in harmony. That was the first arc, and with such a cool premise, the sky's the limit for the series going forward, right? I think so. Probably. Maybe. Now, the rest of the series isn't awful by any means. There are way worse shows out there. But something you'll notice going forward is that for almost every positive, there's a big asterisk right beside it. And then the negatives will start to be more noticeable. Bamboo Rhapsody, Mr. Reek Sign, and Endless Eight are the more plot-focused episodes of the bunch. And I say plot-focused very loosely. Bamboo Rhapsody is a time travel adventure that explores Haruhi's backstory, while Mr. Reek Sign is a missing persons case that evolves into cyberspace pest control. They're fine. They aren't going to win any awards, but they're simple and inoffensive. And Bamboo Rhapsody in particular does set plot threads that will come into play later. But Endless 8? Uh, oh boy. I won't spend that much time on Endless 8. It's one of the most infamous arcs in anime history. And as such, it's been discussed to death by this point. For those unaware, Endless 8 is an 8 episode arc where the characters relive the same two weeks over and over. Pretty cool, right? The issue with Endless 8 is more so with its execution, rather than the actual idea. Each episode is almost identical to the last, with very minor cosmetic changes, like the characters wearing different clothing. You're late, Kyun! Penalty! You're late, Kyun! Where's your motivation, huh? You're late, Kyun! You're late, Kyun! Where's your motivation, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. It's just a mess. It's dull, it's repetitive, and ultimately, not satisfying by its conclusion. While that might have been the point of the arc, it's not a good excuse. There's a way to do immersion in a story, and this isn't it. Endless 8 got so much backlash, one of the directors publicly apologized for it later. It's a shame, because it was a good idea. You see time loops and everything from movies to games, and there's no reason to think that Endless 8 couldn't have been just as good. From what I could research, Endless 8 originally was going to be 3 episodes long. But with the decision to make one of the novels into a movie, it left the team with not a lot of time or source material to pull from. The original 3 episode plan is better, but it doesn't absolve the arc as a whole. The episodes themselves are unremarkable besides the idea behind them. 
but at least it'd be watchable. Decent, even. Which is probably the best word to describe most of the plot-focused episodes. Decent. They tend to start out really interesting, but when you actually watch the episode play out, it ends up being way more mundane than you realized. It's like the series was co-written by J.J. Abrams. But, take everything I just said with a hefty handful of salt. After all, The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya is a slice of life series that just so happens to have supernatural and sci-fi elements. While the premise and plots draw you in, sticking around for the plot is going to be disappointing. It's like watching Community for the plot. The plot threads are more like a bonus to the mundane, laid-back moments that make up the majority of the show. Now, a common complaint of Slice of Life is that it's slow and boring. I should know. I was one of those complainers. I was one of those people who wouldn't get out of bed for anything less than a gripping, intricate plot. It wasn't until years later when I realized how stupid I was. Steins Gate. The Good Place. Invincible. We could do this song and dance all day. If you cut the slice of life from those series and focus on just the plots, they get substantially worse. Slice of life helps flesh out the characters by revealing sides to their personality we might not see otherwise. Like any specific character traits or character quirks. What kind of dynamics they have with the other characters. And building any relationship between the characters. Just to name a few examples. But there's a catch to this. Slice of Life is only as good as the characters in it. And this is easily the biggest issue with the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. With two exceptions, this cast drags down the entire series. And the Slice of Life, mind you, the majority of the show, suffers for it. Let's start with the series' most iconic character. Haruhi is a really cool character. Sometimes. She has a strong introduction as an energetic, aggressive go-getter, and not long after that, she gets solid characterization through her backstory and her interactions with Kion. And that's about all she gets. Her good moments after Melancholy are few and far between, and usually it's because Kion pries it out of her. For most of the series, her assertive, dominating personality takes center stage. 90% of this series is Haruhi steamrolling everyone into some scheme, with Kion being the sole voice of reason. It's entertaining at first, but not as much when you realize that's as good as it gets. Not to mention, many of Haruhi's antics have not aged well. Then I'll tell everyone at school that all you geeks ganged up on her and f***ed her! <laughs> you out of your mind or something? Well, Chief, <laughs> you gonna have- Haruhi being inherently flawed isn't the problem. In fact, Haruhi is really similar to Emma Woodhouse. They're both self-centered, deliberately unlikable, condescending, condescending bench kind of characters. If it worked for Jane Austen in 1812, there's no reason it couldn't work again. But the key difference between these two is that Emma eventually learns the error of her ways. She gets called out for her behavior and goes on to become a better person because of it. And Haruhi doesn't. The sigh of Haruhi Suzumiya is the closest she gets to getting that. It takes an angry, and frankly, completely justified outburst from Kion for her to even realize that she might have been in the wrong. She never apologizes for being a colossal jerk either. Business goes on like usual. Haruhi does change, but her so-called development is so subtle, later Koizumi has to tell the audience, look guys, Haruhi has changed. Source, dude, just trust me. And if you're wondering if Haruhi changes much in the novels, then have I got some news for you. I don't think Haruhi is a badly written character, but she is a frustrating one. She has a lot going for her, like the classic tough exterior, soft interior, and her kinship with Kion. Their relationship is actually the most interesting one in the entire show. Despite their obvious differences, they're really similar underneath, as two people who are never quite honest with themselves. I can confidently say that the show would be much better if their friendship was given a much bigger focus. Because I've seen that show, and it's really good. But at times, it feels like the show goes out of its way to handicap poor Haruhi at every turn. Through the very nature of the premise, she's not allowed to know about all the really interesting stuff going on. She never has a chance to develop a relationship with anyone besides Kion, for reasons that'll become clear shortly. She's written to be so hard-headed that she's never allowed to have that much outward change. 
And later, Kion tries to tell her the truth. And Haruhi just goes, And that sounds like it's not my problem. Besides narrative reasons, I don't see why Haruhi couldn't have a little more outward change, or some awareness of the world around her. It'd be fun to let her be more involved, and we could see sides of her personality that we don't really get a chance to see. It's not like it destroys the integrity of her character. We even get a tease of what that Haruhi would look like in the movie. And she's great! Instead, we're stuck with this version. And when you put it all together, it ends up leaving the most powerful character as a little more than just an overly bossy force of nature. Haruhi is a good character. She just got dealt a crappy hand. And whether you love or hate Haruhi, at least she's worth talking about. The others wish they were so lucky. Do something, Mikudo! Let's get the obvious one out of the way. Mikuru Asahina is a garbage character. Calling her a character isn't even accurate. She's a time machine with a name and a face. And the sad part is, she's not even the best in that category. Up and down stuff in a big blue box. Yes, that's me. A type 40 TARDIS. She exists only for time travel plots and to be Haruhi's Barbie doll, which was never funny in the first place. She has no fun interactions with the others, and she has no fun personality traits. If you take her out and replace her with a DeLorean, nothing changes. And as useless as Asahina is, she's not the only one. Koizumi is the group's esper, which is just a fancy word for someone with psychic powers. And his powers leave a lot to be desired. Basically, he can turn into a bargain bin DBZ character. But he has to be in a certain place, and it has to be during a certain time. And he shows off his powers a whopping three times throughout the show. Wow, so supernatural. For all intents and purposes, he's just a guy. He has zero personality, and his only role in this series is to explain things to the audience in a cryptic, wishy-washy way. And 90% of the time, his reasoning boils down to, dude, just trust me. The only notable thing he ever does is stop Kion from punching Haruhi. I wish I was joking. Like Asahina, Koizumi adds nothing to the series. And sadly, the novels don't fix either of them. The SOS Brigade consists of these five, but it might as well just be Haruhi, Kion, and Nagato. And this is where the show's issues are crystal clear. The melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya is a slice of life series where half its cast is completely useless. A vast majority of their escapades fall into the same formula. Haruhi does something. Asahina cries, Kion complains, Koizumi explains the situation, and Nagato saves the day. The series doesn't have to be this way, but that's just how it is when the cast is so lopsided. Haruhi has a strong personality, but nobody to bounce off of besides Kion. Nagato is too reserved, Asahina just flails and cries, and Koizumi follows her with no resistance. There's just no way for her to develop any other relationship. Kion is a great character, but he can only do so much on his own. His only meaningful relationships are with Haruhi and Nagato. Try as he might, he can't save Asahina or Koizumi. It's not like they have any personality for him to interact with. Giving the other characters more personality, more characterization, literally anything, is the easiest way to make this series amazing. I'm by no means a writing expert, but I don't see why there couldn't have been a little more to the weaker characters. Would it have been that hard to give Asahina some traits that her older self has? Or make Koizumi less of a doormat? Anything is better than a dollar store TARDIS and a Christopher Nolan exposition character. Fixing the weaker characters opens the door for so many fun dynamics. It opens other potential dynamics for Haruhi and Kion, and maybe an actual dynamic between Nagato, Asahina, and Koizumi because as it stands, they don't really have one. The appeal of Slice of Life is watching how each character plays off each other, which isn't what we see in this series. Murder mysteries and movie making are great starting points. That's more than you can say about k -On, where most episodes are the characters drinking tea and eating cake. I don't even like k -On that much, it's just not really my jam. But it shows the potential of Slice of Life good characters will carry a simple, mundane scenario. You see this all. The. Time. And when the characters are well written, a creative scenario makes it even more entertaining. 
And sadly, this is where the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya falls short. Some characters are really good, but the others, not so much. The premise, plots, and scenarios are really creative, but end up being way less interesting when actually played out. There are good moments. Yuki Nagato stands here dramatically, although we don't really know why. But just as many lame ones, and more often than not, all the really fun stuff just turns into Do something, Mikudo! With a series that was so hit and miss, you'd think the movie would just be more of the same. Some good stuff, some okay stuff, and a really lukewarm experience in general. And I couldn't have been more wrong. The disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya is amazing. And the reason why it's so good is so stupidly obvious. It's because this movie is about the two best characters in the entire show. The premise of the movie is that Kyon wakes up to find himself in a world where Haruhi doesn't exist. And with no Haruhi, there's no time travelers or aliens. Since his former friends are either gone or don't remember him, he can't rely on them to save the day at this time. As he tries to figure out the mysteries behind this world, his resolve is tested, and he's forced to answer difficult questions he's ignored up to this point. But as fantastic as Kyon is, he's not the only focus of this movie. That honor goes to Yuki Nagato. Just like Asahina and Koizumi, Nagato's guilty of being fairly one note. After all, she is a robot. It's in her programming. But unlike those jabronis, Nagato plays a vital role in just about every arc. She's really the SOS Brigade's unsung hero. She single-handedly saves the team on countless occasions, as you've seen so far. And she has some good comedic moments. Her deadpan moments are pretty funny. Done something like that before, so just wave your little stick at him. And, and there's some physical comedy that comes from a petite girl doing all these crazy things. She wasn't that bad of a character to begin with, but it's here when she goes from being a good character to being a great one. About three quarters of the way through the movie, it's revealed that this new world was created by Nagato. After all those times saving Kyon, or fixing everyone's problems, even the quiet robot couldn't handle it anymore. Didn't you want to shout, or cry, or yell, leave me alone, I've had enough? Sometimes? Even if you never thought about that stuff, it's normal for you to want to. This movie fleshes out Nagato in ways that we never got a chance to see before. We get insight into feelings she's never had before, and a glimpse into the life she might have wanted. That's more than we get with any supporting character. Just like Kyon, Nagato is an amazing character. She has that awesome combination of story relevance and character progression that the other characters wish they had. As for the rest of the movie, I wish I had more to say about it. It has it all. An eerie premise that forces the main character to rely on his wits and his resolve. Plot threads that tie back into the main series. Genuine stakes and suspense. And best of all, a character-driven focus that brings all the underlying character arcs to the forefront. The film builds to not one, but two amazing character moments. I'll do whatever it takes to bring you back, I mean it. I might not have any power, but I can whip Haruhi up into a frenzy. And it even gives Haruhi a rare display of affection by the end. But, as much as I love the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya, it's really telling that the series' highs are also the most disconnected from the main series. Kion admitting his true feelings to himself, or his conversation with Nagato on the rooftop, are incredible, but they aren't indicative of the series as a whole. Getting to disappearance is a slog, and it's debatable whether or not it's worth going through that just for this movie. Some people can, but for people on the fence, it's hard to tell them that, yes, the series gets better. Dude, just trust me. While the movie does wrap up plot threads, it only adds to the characters that were great to begin with. Disappearance doesn't make Endless 8 suck any less, it doesn't fix the trash characters and mediocre slice of life, and it barely fixes Haruhi herself. If anything, Disappearance shows that this series can flourish. With the right plot and character writing, any one of these characters could have been as well written as Kion and Nagato. Instead, a majority of the series is really underwhelming. As good as melancholy and disappearance are, I don't think it's fair to praise a series for being good sometimes. And while most of this video has been more critical, make no mistake, Nagaro Tanigawa is an incredibly talented author. 
The series' premise and ideas were really created back in 2003, and they still are today. Some parts haven't quite held up, but others do. Many shows could learn a thing or two from this one. I may not be the most avid fan of the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, but it's about due for a comeback. As someone patiently waiting for a Fate Route remake, I know how it feels to be an adaptation limbo. You guys deserve more than a soulless substitute. Take it from me, someone who spent the last 20 minutes complaining about the show. Some of the plot lines and new characters in the later novels are genuinely really cool, and I hope someday you can see it unfold on screen.